Hello again, everybody. I am Louise Eddington, the um, Cosmic Owl of Cosmic Owl Astrology. I am a wisdom weaver who pulls together threads of astrology, mysticism, myth myths, uh, tarot, symbolism, all those kind of things to try and help us to create a story of what's going on. Now, I'm coming to you today because I want to talk about this month and uh, April. I'm recording this on, are we on April the 2nd? Oh, I'm, I'm kind of not very with, with it exactly, but I think we are. We're on April the 2nd at this point. And April the 2nd is um, a month pretty much unlike anything most astrologers alive have ever seen. If we look back in history, the way things are colliding and adding up, um, it is going to take us into a new reality. Now, no aspects work alone. This is going to keep developing over time. You know, there are more aspects to come, but this month is a game changer. Um, just briefly, we have the eclipses. We've already had a lunar eclipse that was on March 25th, but we have a big Aries eclipse on April the 8th that is really long and exactly conjunct Chiron. I'm not going to look at the astrology again. I am going to focus on one aspect of it. But I'm recording this today because we have Venus and Neptune conjunct early tomorrow morning, April the 3rd, 9, 10 a.m. Eastern, which is an interesting time for me because that's the time I was always told I was born. But then when I rectified my whole chart, I found it was earlier. But anyway, I was like, hmm, that's an interesting time. Um, and Neptune and uh, the, uh, um, sorry, Neptune and Venus meet very regularly because Neptune's cycle is um, kind of follows the sun, but retro retrogrades kind of get in the way and make it longer sometimes and make it, um, you know, the conjunct time between conjunctions. But Venus Neptune is in itself an amazing conjunction. It Venus is, you know, the lesser benefit, so to speak, although I really think we're moving into a new reality regarding astrology as well um, and, and stopping looking at everything in this fear based kind of way, like eclipses can cause bad things and good things, you know, like the 2017 eclipse clearly did split split the USA in half politically. But many people have had good things happen since 2017. So, you know, eclipses have all the astrology and all the energies happen on multiple levels and you know a real I think as astrologers we need to kind of step into the multiverse of non-duality that we are really moving into and stop seeing everything as so black and white and look at the different possibilities and then also look at the bigger picture and this is what Venus Neptune is calling us to do. So Venus and Neptune are meeting and Venus is exalted in the sign of, of Pisces. And Neptune is the modern ruler of Pisces. And Pisces is the energy of the cosmic soup. It is the energy of the amniotic fluid of the womb. But it's also the place of um, kind of destruction before death. It's where things dissolve and, um, you know, are taken away before we die, like how everything breaks down as we return to dust, so to speak, dust to dust, all that kind of thing. So Venus and Neptune are meeting at what's called her degree of exaltation, Venus's degree of exaltation. And this is one place where we can look at some of the traditional astrology and mix it in with the uh, new astrology as we move into this new reality. So exaltation degrees mean the degree where a planet is at its prime, at its best. 
So this conjunction is at Venus exaltation degree, which is 27 Pisces. It's actually at just 28, but it's close enough. And, and so what we're going to do, we're going to talk about that degree a little bit. Then we're going to talk about another degree. But before I go back to the degrees, I'm going to talk about a couple of other things as well. So there's going to be some myths involved in this. But while we're on the Venus conjunction with Neptune, this is another big conjunction in the month of April. So we have the eclipse. We have this conjunction at the degree of Venus's exaltation, where Venus is already exalted in the sign and Neptune is the modern ruler. This could not be kind of higher consciousness or higher connection with source or uh, the collective subconscious or that um, energy of the chaos of creation. OK, so that's really important. I do quickly want to say that um, Neptune and Venus will meet again on February the 1st, 2025, also at the ex degree of exaltation, they will meet at 27 degrees, 59 minutes of Pisces. And that by that point, the North Node will be conjunct. So that in a, um, in, on February the 1st next year is another move in this. But this month is combined with the um, eclipses. But I do want to quickly say that... <laughs> Um, Chiron, um, who I'm going to talk about as well, will still be at 19 degrees Aries on that next conjunction next February the 1st. He will, he'll be back there after retrograde and going forward. Then Neptune and Venus will meet again at the very last degree of Pisces in at the end of March 2025. And then they will meet at the first degree of Aries in um, on May the 2nd, 2025. Of course, there's going to be different things going on there. But that next one, February the 1st, 2025, is going to be an important one as well. Not least because Chiron is at the other degree I want to talk about. Chiron is conjunct the eclipse. Um, um, I talked about it with Melanie Reinhardt in my interview with her, talking about the centaur Chiron. And it's exactly conjunct the um, April the 8th eclipse. Now, hold, I'm going to talk to you about the story of Chiron and how it fits with something else that's going on. So, okay. But the important thing to note is that that 19 degree Aries, where the eclipse is, where Chiron was when the nodes moved back into Aries, where Chiron will be on the eclipse, where Chiron will be when the north node moves back into Pisces to move towards that other exalted degree conjunction. Chiron's at 19 degrees in all those times. So, you know, to look after February, um, after that con next conjunction, next February, Chiron will not leave that 19 degree mark until... Uh, until, let me see, February the 15th, 2025. Now, don't worry about all those details, but the reason why it's important is because not only is 19 degrees the, um, uh, the degree of the eclipse and the degree where Chiron is all the time, it's also another degree of exaltation. And it's the degree of exaltation of the sun, which is Apollo. And Chiron was Apollo's um, student, if you like. I'll talk about that when we go to the myth. So we're going to be weaving some new myths in here. And I've been saying for a long time that I feel like we need to we weave some new myths. Myths are stories that make sense of the universe. And, um, you know, if we, we take these stories and we live by them and sometimes... 
they instill fear. So there's a couple of things I want to talk about. So I'm going to start with the concern about CERN. <laughs> I I make myself laugh, playing with words sometimes. Okay, so um, the word the word concern is in itself is um, is a word that has where's my oh there it is. So let's look at the end etymology of concern. Now it's come to mean um, worry, disturbance, uneasiness, and anxiety. Um, and uh, this shifted um, in the late 15th century, okay, which is the 16, uh, 1400. And that brings me to, a, rings a bell. There's something that's happening now that has not happened since 1501 and I can't remember um, what it was, but um, it doesn't matter. But before that, before it came to shift to mean worry, disturbance, um, or, or to affect the interest of and to be of importance to, which is con, and interestingly, con means with, if, if you go to the Spanish as well. Originally, the word meant, so I'm going to read this from etymology online, etymo, yeah, etym, etymo online or whatever you say it. But anyway, um, it used to meant, it used to mean of persons to perceive, distinguish, also of things to refer to, relate to, pertain to, from old French concerner and directly from medieval Latin concernary, which meant concern, touch, belong to. A figurative use of late Latin concernary what meant to sift, mix as in a sieve which was from an assimilated form of Latin com, with or together, and cernary to sift, hence perceive, apprehend. So in that kind of, and uh, you know, meaning, I take that the sifting and the with together, like you're baking a new thing or weaving together the things to create a new story. And this is what I feel we're doing in astrology, in mythology, in the world. We have to start kind of opening our mind and looking at new things. Now, why did I want to talk about the, the concern about CERN? <laughs> Um, CERN is also from the French. Um, CERN, you know, basically, uh, you know, stands for the Centre for Nuclear Research. OK, and it's been around for a long time. But why there's a lot going on and a lot of fear coming up around CERN and the hydron, um, whatever it's called, hydron, oh, hydron collider is that CERN have announced that they are going to start up the Hydron Collider under this eclipse. And to in their hope that they are still hoping to find more about the Higgs boson particle, which is the um, God particle, as they call it, but also, you know, to uh, to find dark matter, which kind of is the glue that keeps the universe together. So basically they're trying to find the way the universe works, the origin of the universe, how it's what what holds it together, what creates it. I think there's good potential from all of this, but I'm not a scientist, but I think there's no reason to fear it. Why is there fear? Well, a or with Neptune in Pisces, the Conspiracy theories and fear um, energy is up a notch. However, I think this Venus-Neptune conjunction at the exalted degree is saying fear, um, you know, love, not fear. 
face it with love and possibilities and go, you know, what what magic could come with this instead of going, oh, I think this is a bad idea. I think, oh, my God, because, you know, is your fear going to stop it? Mm, probably not. <laughs> May as well kind of look at it as, oh, my goodness, something amazing, because Venus and Neptune at that degree is the magic of creation could create something really amazing after all we are all born from chaos you know the big bang happened so they think and then all the things particles and molecules and things kind of eventually kind of settle into where they are now but they're still moving of course and we are all kind of molecules within molecules and waves and particles all bouncing off each other anyway um that but we were, we came from that chaos in and in some respects we are that chaos so that that's one reason why the fear is high because of the venus neptune and the other thing is the fear of eclipses i've you know i found eclipses to do good things and bad things and i feel this eclipse is really quite powerful so the but one of the first things I'm going to talk about is the story of Chiron. But then I also want to talk about the story of Shiva. Because if you don't know about CERN, they actually have a statue of Shiva, the destroyer, out there. And this is the Centre for Nuclear Research. And, of course, we've just had Oppenheimer with his quote at the at the end saying, now I am the destroyer of worlds. Actually, let's go to that quote first. OK, now here's where it comes in pretty handy that I actually read um, some, <laughs> some of the Bhagavad Gita and some of the Hindu texts when I was in college because I, I studied the world religions. Uh, there's a great book on Hinduism if you want to. And um, uh, this is my this is so old. K M Sen Hinduism. I've lost my copy of the Bhagavad Gita, but Hinduism is. I'm going to read just the back of his thing. Hinduism is a guide to the, uh, sorry, is unique among the great religions in that it's got no founder. There's no prophet. It grew gradually over a period of 5,000 years, absorbing and assimilating all of the religions and cultural movements of India. It has no Bible or Quran or, you know, any kind of one holy book. It has many works such as the Vedas, the Upanishads and the Bhagavad Gita. And none of them are um, authoritative, but none, uh, they all have some authority, but they're not exclusively authoritative. Hindu is the most, Hinduism is the most fascinating religion. I remember when I was in college and we actually went to the Hindu temple. And, um, you know, I said, how can you convert to Hinduism? He was like, the guy, the guy was like, you are a Hindu already. You know, we are all Hindu. And one fascinating thing about Hinduism is their gods, their pantheon. They have so many gods and they're all faces of the one God, but they all bleed into each other. The stories that are told in their holy books, whatever you want to call them, the Upanishads, the Vedas, and the Bhagavad Gita, are stories of all these faces of different gods, but they are all faces of the divine, whatever that is. And these stories are kind of mythological stories to help us make sense of the world, like our Greek myths, like the myth of Chiron, and so on and so forth. So, because, um, you know, we had uh, Oppenheimer had his interest in um, the Bhagavad Gita. So now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds is from the 32nd verse in the 11th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. 
However, it's not the full quote. Okay, so the full quote actually says, or is the conventional translation of this verse is, I am time, the cause of world destruction, mighty come here to annihilate the worlds, which sounds pretty frightening, but in, <laughs> in, um, in the Hindu philosophy and in those stories, I'm not going to go and read the whole Bhagavad Gita bit to you or anything, but if you go and search it, that Bhagavad Gita came, uh, time actually came from a battle between Arjuna and Krishna and not Shiva. So Shiva, the destroyer, did not say that. So that's one thing, first of all. OK, so, but that now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds, has been associated with Oppenheimer, of course, and the atom bomb. But of course, nuclear discoveries have brought us good things as well as the awful bomb. You know, that was dreadful. And Hinduism is very, um, let's say, very human in that way that they believe something has to be destroyed for something new to be reborn. In that respect, it is a, um, um, a the tower card, if you like. Um, but I will get to Shiva in a minute. So uh, the Bible, the verses refer to uh, the sublime form. This is going to get a bit technical for um, Hinduism, that Vishwarupa, Lord Krishna, in one of his guises, takes in the Bhagavad Gita when he reveals his divine nature to the warrior prince Arjuna. Who are you, asks Arjuna. I am time, replies Krishna. Powerful destroyer of worlds, grown immense here to annihilate these men. Arjuna is blinded by Krishna's radiance. Could say that's the sun, if you like. Could say that's Apollo. Even as he quakes with fear at God's capacity to destroy evil with the fire emanating from his ferocious visage. So, you know, this story in a nutshell really was the belief that, you know, we have to destroy kind of the bad to create the good and kind of all of that kind of energy. So in itself, that quote, even though it's come up at this time for a reason in the form of the, Oppen, uh, the movie Oppenheimer, is not a reason to fear this eclipse or to fear CERN. All right. Um, CERN has been renowned for some pretty good, you know, discoveries, even though it really costs an awful lot of money. But I think it's undoubted that we really need, unless we're going to go and live back as hunter gatherers and do away with electricity and things, then, um, you know, we need some new discoveries. We need more better clean energy. We need all that kind of stuff as well to create this new reality we're moving into. And so here's to the eclipse. Um, so the eclipse conjunct, um, uh, maybe I should give you some of the, no, I'm not going to, you can look it up as well, the good things that have come from the eclipse. So let's talk about the story of Shiva, first of all, because that's the other reason there is concern about CERN. <laughs> Shiva is um, an interesting character as well. Shiva is often bled over into Krishna. Um, some think Shiva is, you know, because uh, remember that Hinduism is this um, genre mixing, you know, period of all these stories over time over 5000 of years 5000 years absorbing and assimilating um all the religions and cultural movements of india so all these stories kind of bleed into each other there's different schools of thought and there's different kind of sects if you like but let's look at the main story of shiva that i want to talk about okay so Shiva 
one of his roles. Um, so Lord Shiva, he's been associated with a lot of names. Most of these names have mostly appeared with a specific deed or story as per the Indian mythology, which is what Hinduism tends to do, different faces of Shiva. Neil Kant is one of them, and the name emerged from a story affiliated with the story of Samudra Manthan, where Shiva drank the poison to prevent calamity and destruction of the universe. As is mentioned in the Bhagavata, Bhagavata Purana, the Mahabharata and Vishnu Purana, they're different stories. The story goes back to the time when there was a big war between the Devas and the Asuras. Unfortunately, the Devas were deprived of all their strength, energy and fortune um, as sage Durvasa had cursed the Devas following an incident with Indra, the king of Svarga. So you can see how these myths get very confusing, right, and stories. So now with such loss, the Devas eventually ended up losing the battle with Asuras, led by Bali, who has now gained control over the whole of the universe. The Devas, in distress, went to seek the help of Lord Vishnu, who suggested they'd be more tactful and prudent, blah, blah, blah. But therefore... Um, using Mount Mandura as a churning rod and Vasuki, the Nagaraja, who holds on to Shiva's neck as the churning rope, both the Asuras and Dev Divas started churning the ocean, Pisces, for pulling out the nectar of or immortality. It so happened that while pulling out the nectar of immortality, birthing out of that cosmic soup of the oceanic realms right where we're at with this conjunction today you could say that's one reading of it at least um the ocean released a poison released a poison of sorts called hala hala that could wipe out the whole of creation this in turn made everyone almost choke to death with suffocation because of the powerful poison that was released. Agitated with this, the divas went to Lord Shiva. Here's where Shiva comes in for help, as he was the only saviour who could do the undoable and save everybody from this wrath. Um, so uh, Shiva, in his form there, consumed the poison, okay, um, to save humanity from calamity and destruction. In this myth, Shiva's throat turned blue because of the pain and intensity of the poison. He did not let it go down, which is why he let the poison stay in his throat, so that it did not kill him. There are other versions of the story, though, of course, <laughs> where Shiva, while trying to drink the, drink the poison, moaned in pain, um, which his wife, Pavati could not witness. That's why she grabbed the throat of Lord Shiva so that the poison would not trickle down and hurt him. Either way, the poison was blocked in the throat of Shiva, which turned it blue, which is why the name Neil Kantz was given to Lord Shiva. So in other words, this is one of the age old, kind of myths of somebody taking the poison and suffering for saving humanity. It's like the crucifixion of Christ and all those kind of things. So one kind of thing here is, uh, you know, this is kind of a in Ganesha speak. That's a good kind of site for some of these things. There's various readings of the story as all these things are. But the story of this generally is associated with the awakening of the conscious soul of human humanity. OK, and Shiva kind of taking that poison so that the human consciousness could awaken. And in this story, um, you know, they're saying the Hindus say that you could be being called to be more like Lord Shiva, who is humble, compassionate 
powerful, empathetic, and is somebody ready to go through severe penance to do good for hum humanity. So, you know, we've got mixed up, as we do, us humans, with this destroyer of worlds and Shiva the destroyer. They are different kind of energies. Now then, Chiron, conjunct the eclipse, has this similar kind of story. You know, Chiron had this uh, journey of suffering. He was immortal, but he was half man, half human. Um, and, and Shiva has very different emanations as well. The Hindu gods tend to be very much more kind of human in nature in some ways. In, um, and I really think as uh as astrologers and mythologists and however we work we need to get away from just these um greek myths you know they were watered down versions of some very ancient myths as the story of jesus was even more watered down okay but the story of chiron is one of sacrifice but achilles um was um an apollo was were taught him his medicine man things um they taught him his um uh, strengths and his th his things so chiron was taught by apollo and artemis i think yeah um hunting medicine music gymnastics art of prophecy and and you can read about that in the wonderful um, um achilles the Song of Achilles, that was it, by Madeline Miller. But um, Chiron was the most distinguished of centaurs, right? And, um, and so, but his story is, again, one of the poison. So Chiron had a friendship with Peleus, who was um, Achilles' grandson, I think, um, and Chiron saved him from the hands of the other centaurs and restored to him the sword which Acastus had concealed. Um, but later in the story, Chiron also then developed a friendship with Hercules and um, and was injured by a poison arrow. I think I'm messing up that myth a little bit, but you can go and read, read it yourself as well. Again, there's a different version, except that Chiron was injured by poison. And it was a wound that would not heal because Chiron was Im immortal. Okay. So... Um, It's it's kind of another of those kind of struggles between heroes and things, and then this wounded kind of savior kind of figure. So there was Shiva, and then there's Chiron. Okay, so Chiron was um, injured in the foot or the um, heel, whichever you want to say, and um, then after many kind of decades, we kind of assume eventually Chiron gave up. The, his immortality to save Prometheus, who incidentally <laughs> um, is another name for Uranus, Richard Tarnus um, in Cosmos and Psyche and in a paper he wrote called Prometheus the Awakener says that, you know, naming uh, Uranus, Uranus in astrology, the planet, is is kind of a little bit of a disservice to the energy because it's more Promethean in nature. Either way, I'm I'm not too worried what's in the name, other than the fact this this um this month as well, Jupiter, Zeus, the king of the gods, um, once Chiron gave up his immortality to and gave it to Prometheus so that Prometheus was healed after being chained to a rock, after bringing fire down to humanity. Zeus placed Chiron among the stars. Okay. <laughs> 
and Chiron became a, uh, you know, a constellation up in the sky. So he was kind of immortalized in that way, even though he was physically dead. So Chiron, in, a, in this essence, came became another god up there, whereas before he'd been a half man, half human, um, son of Cronus, who was Saturn in many ways, all these myths kind of over oh, they just kind of come together. You know, I mentioned Shiva's wife, you know, and she was kind of the Caratlog figure, if you like, who's also aspecting this um, this eclipse. Um, and Caratlo was Chiron's wife. And um, uh, she was a shapeshifter as well. She kind of was of that water nymph. And Chiron was the son of Cronus, um, which is kind of Saturn and Phil Philera, who was also a nymph. All these stories kind of mix into one. But basically, this story is a story of, um, you know, destroying something, giving something up to create an amazing new reality and to save humanity. Okay. And it's so important because we have these critical degrees or these exaltation degrees, all right? Um, you know, I could say more, but I'm I'm really kind of not going to go on and on. I think you get the idea that we need a deeper reading of these myths. I'm pretty sure CERN realise that it's an eclipse and they realized the significance of Shiva, the full myth. Um, one other thing I do want to mention is that the statue of Shiva that they have uh, <clears throat> at CERN is Shiva, oh, Shiva as Lord of the Dance, okay, which is Nataraha. If I'm saying that right, I'm probably not. Nataraha. As a symbol, Shiva Nataraha is a brilliant invention. It combines in a single image Shiva's roles as creator, preserver and destroyer of the universe and conveys the Indian conception of the never ending cycle of time. Although it appeared in sculpture as early as the 5th century, it pre its pre present world famous form evolved under the rule of Cholas, whoever that was. Shiva's dance is set with a flaming halo. There's the fire of Prometheus, right, that we've got this month as well with this conjunction with Zeus, Jupiter. Um, and the god holds in his upper right hand the Dharmaru, which is a hand drum that made the first sounds of creation. His upper left hand holds Agni, the fire that will destroy the universe. And with his lower right hand, he makes a gesture that allays fear, which is actually kind of that one, I think. Oh, no, is it that one? Oh, no, it's more like that one, <laughs> which is kind of the blessing of the Pope. See how these things come in over and over again? Um, the dwarf-like figure being trampled by his right foot in this Lord of the Dance Thing, represents Apasmara Purusha, which is illusion which leads mankind astray. Shiva's front left hand pointing to his raised left foot. In fact, let me show you the picture while we do this. Signifies refuge for the troubled soul. The energy of his dance makes his hair fly to the sides the symbols imply that through belief in Shiva, his devotees can achieve salvation. And that's the Shiva that we that is outside CERN or at the entrance of CERN. This is the Shiva. Oh, so I want to leave you with the symbols. The um, I'm just going to read the symbols for these two critical degrees. So remember there was 27 um, Pisces. Um, so we go up to 28. So first the 
Omega Symbol is a shy poet in hiding, and John Sandbach says, a very sensitive spirit is here and a great need to be attuned to the self in a supportive way so that what it needs to express may come forth. The, this degree seeks to avoid the opinions, input and other static of the outside world so that it may be itself with a complete lack of inhibition. It needs to find a space in which that, in which what is within may be coaxed to come forth. Now the Chandra symbol for this degree is a horde of monkeys chattering. The mind is multi-leveled and multifaceted, never at rest, always playing with ideas. This degree is acutely aware of this and at best knows how to overcome the stress, distractions and diversions these monkeys can create. He says, these two symbols seem diametrically opposed for the shy poet is singular and rather than chattering like the monkeys has chosen to retreat from the world. The poet hides so as to hear his own inner voice. The chattering monkeys are the world. The poet hides Oh, I'd said that. Whether this degree chooses to be a part of the world or to find a place apart from it, the need is to listen to the higher self, which can be heard in silence. Or if one has developed the art of focus and non-attachment, even heard in the midst of the world's chatterings. So I would merely interpret that as my constant hammering on for self-care and taking some time alone, doing like your walks alone, things like that. So you can hear your inner voice whilst also being in the world. Interestingly, Mercury is kind of that chatter and Mercury is retrograde this month as well in Aries combined with the eclipse and Mercury retrograde is also about going within and listening to the inner voice. Now I'll read you the Sabian symbol. I'm going to read doc, Dr. Mark Edmund Jones um, original kind of writing and reading of it. So the Sabian symbol Pisces 28 is a fertile garden under the moon. This is a symbol of a simple satisfaction through outer rather than inner mass manifestations of reality or of a normal self-dedication to purely conventional accomplishment. Humans are blessed as they as they are more than the average, more, more the average than the exceptional individual, since um, they then are legion in service to other humanity. Their struggles have the common note in which the race survives and in their archetypal makeup, there is room to salvage all the failures and embody all the contributions of the far more lonely genius. The key word is ultimacy. When positive, the degree is high reward um, in, in the world and exceptional self-integrity in using the material goods. Um, and so, you know, this is, I'm going to actually kind of go and read James Burgess as well, because this is, to my mind, a fertile garden under the moon talks about growing your own garden. All right. So this is about fulfilling all your earthly desires and this abundance in every way, not just material money. This is a, you know, spiritual, physical and material um, abundance and showing gratitude for that and about creating that garden. So you can kind of see that this um, this degree is that we have tomorrow morning after I record this is just quite magical. All right. So that's the ex exaltation degree of this Venus Neptune conjunction. But then we have um, the eclipse degree, which is this exaltion, the degree of the sun's exaltation with Chiron, that form of sacrifice and healing exactly conjunct. So Aries 20, streets littered with many colors of confetti, which is the um, omega degree. Um, John Sandbach says this is manifesting 
inspired about victory over addictions. We have the ability to bring a vibration of celebration into all aspects of life um, you're communicating to people how to renew themselves remember Dane Rudyard actually called this degree the resurrection degree right okay um, but how to blossom out of their set patterns and routines and beliefs I would say it's important to not become frustrated if your message sometimes isn't heard. You are on a different wavelength from other people. I feel like that sometimes I'm always saying, you know, we, you are in renewal, you know, blossom out of your set routines. This is, yeah, I feel, feel like this is me in some ways. Um, but um, many cannot embrace the joy and enthusiasm for life that you can but don't let this stop you for people need the exuberant energy you have to offer and that's going to apply to thing this energy coming in for everybody on this eclipse to step into this joy and enthusiasm for life and stepping out of that old kind of mindset and more but then we have the chandra symbol is an empty courtyard before change can happen, though, there must be a place prepared inside so the new may enter. Celebration is the acknowledgement that something important has occurred and that it should be honoured. But once the celebration is over, the way is clear for the next step of the journey, blessed with the colours of the recent triumph. The confetti lying in the streets is about what is over the empty courtyard is about what is coming. And this degree stands at the crossroads of that time of renewal, acknowledging the past, but open to the future. And then just a little reminder that the Sabian symbol for this is a young girl, a child, very Aries, very new, but she happens to be a girl in this case as well feeding birds which is the mind often as well in winter and we sit it surely feels like we're in a winter right collectively um and james burgess says seeing life as a constant opportunity to experience love he says life's very harshness the kind of suffering of chiron she yeah, all those things the poisons is what enables us to learn of love's unfathomable depth being innocent and fearless in love and he also says nature is harsh people and animals suffer and starve and they die yet without harshness compassion could not exist there would be no place for it there is no higher purpose than to live life as a constant expression of compassionate love this is neither fanciful nor sentimental love it's about feeding the hungry stranger in all ways, okay, including the stranger within. So I kind of talked a lot and I hope I've, you know, there's so much fear out there around this eclipse and CERN starting up under the eclipse, but really all the energies are higher energies pushing us to create this new reality we're moving into and to um, um, quote my my friend uh, Laurie Lothian of Lunatic Astrology, her, you, her channel, you know, on my Facebook post about, I've made a Facebook post about this fear around CERN. She made a joke about um, um, being a, 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 a chiropractic adjustment and Chiron represents hands healing and Cairo and all adjustments kinds of things. So there's a lot of adjustment energy in this of, you know, the old world's dying. We're making space for this magical new world. And somebody's taking, we are taking the poison in many ways, but humanity is not going to die. So, um, uh, I hope you listen to the end. Um, I just hear, you know, I'm kind of feel like that figure who's going, honestly, it's all going to be okay. And I think it is honestly all going to be okay. Love you all next time.